as we raise androgens to superphysiological ranges, we don't want to suppress estrogens. We want them to follow with us so that we can leverage their therapeutic benefits. This video is sponsored by Mizumi, the number one pick for men on TRT. Shop now at Mizumi's using the link in the description of this video. Hey guys, Danny Bossa from the TRT and Hormone and Optimization YouTube channel. Uh, joined today with our guest, Victor Black out of Thailand. How are you doing, Victor? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Danny. Good. Victor has uh, been a very popular coach these days on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, he's been training for 38 years. I've seen a lot of the uh, before and afters that uh, he's been posting. It's quite impressive. So uh, clearly seems to know what the hell he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike me. Um, so I, I've been watching some of Victor's uh, posts on Instagram uh, from time to time. They're very informative, uh, very detailed, uh, very, you know, very high level. Um, and th th there was one post that he made recently, which got me into, into messaging him uh, where he was talking about estrogen management. Um, Cause obviously when he's doing training for, uh, for guys on com in competitions, they will obviously sometimes use stuff outside of testosterone, obviously. Um, but th th the principles he was talking about still apply to guys just doing a straight up TRT. So thought I would kind of pick his brain about that one. There was a lot of things he, I agreed with what he was saying. Some were, wanted a little bit of clarification. So uh, Victor, tell me what's your, what's your approach on this? Uh, we can just kind of start from, sure. start from the beginning. I think, I think it's probably important just to start off to, you know, set the scene to explain that um, unashamedly I am an enhanced trainer and athlete and coach, which is outside of the, the scope of, I think, you know, really what we would call testosterone replacement therapy, uh, you know, for hypergonadal men. I think that's, you know, need, needs to be clear up front. What, why? It's because really what, what my tribe are interested in is not necessarily following the guidelines of the endocrine society. <laughs> during, I think you can, you can have, you know, plausibly many threads of conversation and each one is, you know, credible in its own right. It really depends on who the audience is and who's addressing that audience. So if we're talking to physicians and we're the endocrine society, clearly we have frameworks, we have guidelines that we're, we're, we're constrained by. And I respect that. I understand that. But it's also, you know, it's a fair conversation to say that the enhanced community are not constrained by those guidelines. And then, you know, because of that, because of the nature of self-administration and because of the nature of, you know, what we call more than TRT, more than hormone replacement practices, you know, there's certain behaviours that we engage in that may raise eyebrows, if you wish, you know, within those circles. But, you know, we also, you know, you know, quietly off to the corner get a lot of, you know, uh, feedback and a lot of, you know, uh, praise from, from, from practitioners in that space that understanding that, you know, if we're going to, expose ourselves to elevated levels of androgens, there are consequences to those behaviors. Deleterious consequences, positive consequences. And I think it's fair to say that what separates me from most people that talk in this, in this tribe is I'm not really talking about what works. You know, I think there's a lot of voices out there that talk about, you know, you know, quote, unquote, work, works. What I'm interested in is how we can uh, engage in these practices in a, in, a, in a safer framework. I don't use the word safe. I don't think it's responsible. It's disingenuous to you know, go around saying that you know, the application of eleva elevated super physiological androgens and other performance enhancing drugs over multi-year timeframes can be described as safe. And so really the discussion is about mitigating the potential problems and potential deleterious or adverse effects to the greatest degree that we can. And so a lot of the things that I post on Instagram, a lot of things I post on, on, on social media are really about, you know, calling into question historical practices and asking, look, is there, a, is there a plausibly better way to do this? And I think that it's fair to say that, you know, there is some crossover between clinical practice and, and, and practices of the enhanced tribe. There is a margin in the middle. And I think it's probably fair to say, if we're honest, that, um, you know, five years ago, those two groups didn't really touch with each other. But I also think it's fair to say in the last five years, there are a lot of men that have had life-changing outcomes from hormone replacement therapy. And they're starting to ask the question, what, what else is there? Mm -hmm. Are there other compounds that potentially synergistic here that I might consider a 
And obviously, I have a simple example with that, as I think there are a great number of men today that are looking at testosterone replacement therapy and recombinant human growth hormone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is not uncommon today where guys are considering this. This was only five years ago, really, the domain of, as I said, the enhanced community today. It's becoming more and more mainstream. And it's fair to say that there are, you know, six, seven, eight different metabolic pathways that we could modulate if we if we wanted to. And I'm not proposing that, you know, the average guy in your audience needs to do that. But that's that's really my niche. That's really my domain. And so a lot of the information that I present, a lot of the topics that I discuss are really focused around that community. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you mentioned I, I've been talking about estradiol and estrogen management recently. Maybe we can talk a little bit about how we go about approaching estrogen management in our tribe. And to see whether there's any, you know, any insight that might be gleaned from that for application within with, within your community itself, yeah. Sure, sure. Cool. So, one one of the things that we know is that when we elevate androgens, there are deleterious effects on cardiovascular health, on kidney health, on cognitive health. There are concerns that we have, yeah. And estrogen is protective of all of these domains. Estrogen is considered to be cognitive protective. It's considered to be cardioprotective. It's considered to be protective of the renal system. So an example, with elevated androgens into super physiological range has to be viewed as detrimental to kidney health. Estrogens inversely are protective of kidney health. So in other words, as we raise androgens to super physiological ranges, we don't want to suppress estrogens. We want them to follow with us so that we can leverage their therapeutic benefits in that regard. Just so we're just to get a clarification, when you're saying androgens, are you referring testosterone specifically, or if you're implementing other like synthetic compounds? I, I think it's fair to say that most people today in the enhanced community are using both testosterone and other derivatives of, of testosterone. Yeah, very few people are using only testosterone yeah mm -hmm. but it applies to equally to both yeah well let's say the just straight up trt guy does he have anything to worry about in regards to kidney issues if he's got his doses maybe just slightly over super physiological range i, I would argue no but that but 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 with some caveats to that yeah so the classic example i would say is you know there are a, a potentially a lot of you know, question marks even over testosterone replacement practices that we've had to address as a tribe kind of moving forward. And I think we've made great strides in the last 10 years of, you know, making feel, people feel comfortable about the safety profile of testosterone replacement therapy. But it's disingenuous to say there aren't examples of individuals in clinical literature that seem to have an adverse effect. And I would argue it's not the androgens. You know, in very often it's other underlying health conditions like insulin resistance that kind of like underpin this. So there are certain conditions like prostate health that I would argue low testosterone, high estrogen and insulin resistance is like a is like bad juju if you if you want to put it that way, Joanne. So yeah. so I would argue it's not simply a case of, you know, if his androgen levels are at appropriate levels, if his estrogen levels are appropriate levels, then you know like he, he gets a, a you know a gold star as it were. There's more going on than that sort of thing. But I think it's fair to say that if we were to elevate androgens, it's a fair and reasonable assessment to say the consequence of elevating androgens need to be seen as, you know, as uh, you know, neuro de detrimental to the neuro health, to, to, to cognitive health, detrimental to cardiovascular health, detrimental to um, renal health. And as I said, and then we have the consequences of saying, well, what are we going to do about, you know, water retention and these sorts of things? And so... One of the things that I find that, uh, you know, the testosterone replacement community could potentially learn from these discussions is basically this, and that is um, when we take testosterone, a lot of people report problems with water retention regardless of the dose they're taking, yeah? So within physiological range, there's still a discussion about water retention, mm -hmm. yeah? Within physiological range, there's still a discussion about, about uh, uh, elevated hematocrit levels, yeah, mm -hmm. there can still be in some individuals a discussion about elevated hypertension or hyper, hypertensive outcomes. Yeah, so I I think it's fair to say so, there is some crossover between those two groups, between those two cohorts. It's more profound. In other words, 
the more you take, the more you tend to see it, you know, to keep it super simple. But I think there is a crossover. I think plenty of people within your tribe would say, yes, that's me. I'm constantly batting, battling against elevated hematocrit levels. Yes, that's me. I, I have issues with water retention that I'm trying to address. And so that we have in common. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, just to, to dive right in there, one of the, the great ironies, of course, of, of the discussion that follows about estrogen is, so if we talk about estrogen and we talk about water retention, it's a fair question to say, well, is elevated estrogen directly responsible for increases in water retention or is there a secondary mechanism that's causing that? You know, and I would challenge that m- most people are not even aware that estrogen does not directly you know, stimulate water retention. It certainly is impactful, but it's via an indirect effect on the ren and angiotensin aldosterone system. So, in other words, estrogen and what people don't often realize, androgens, testosterone and other androgens, recombinant human growth hormone, these are sex hormones, progesterone, that potentially modulate the outcomes of the ren and angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay? So we see consequential increases in water retention from the application of androgens like testosterone, but it's via the testosterone and via the estrogen and potentially via you know, gr- gr- increases in, you know, in, in IGF-1 levels, et cetera. Yeah? So traditionally what we've done in that space is blamed estrogen, which is somewhat ironic when you think about it. So it's one of several you know, st- what we would call stimulatory inputs on the RAS. But for some reason, we want to single it out and, and, and simply blame that. And that's simply not the case. We have very good evidence. It's really not even a discussion that says when you elevate androgens, you activate the renin angi- angiotensin system. This is the, the system that underpins elevation of hypertensive outcomes. It's the system that under, underpins elevations of hematocrit. And you know, not surprisingly, it's the system that underpins water retention. And so the obvious question would say, well, why are we blaming estrogen to begin with? Why are we not blaming these practices? And if we're mm-hmm. going to address it, why would we not go to the problem and fix the problem, which is the, the, the RAS system? Why are we trying to modulate one of the stimulatory inputs when you consider those stimulatory inputs have benefits to us? Okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm not overly familiar with how much your audience knows about estrogen. So let me, let me just put a couple of flags in the sand and then we can come back and revisit those. It's not well understood that estrogen is a hypertrophic pathway in its own right, okay? So activation of the estrogen receptors are basically a hypertrophic and, and what we call forced production pathway. We don't want to block this. This is something that performance athletes are seeking. So crushing estrogen is something that we really don't want to avoid, was that we want to avoid, not just because it's cognitive protective or renal protective or cardiovascular protective, but it's also a a positive performance enhancing outcome for strength athletes and bodybuilders. But at the same time, it's disingenuous to say, yeah, but what are we going to do about water retention? What are we going to do about potentially the stimulatory effect on, on breast tissue with gynecomastic outcomes? So the logic says here, well, let's just deal with water retention if estrogen is providing all of these plausible benefits to us, why don't we leave that alone and go directly to the ren and angiotensin aldosterone system and deal with that through the application of like a, an ARB, like an angioretensin receptor blocker, yeah? So mm. the irony then is if you block that, then many of the ills of our tribe, hypertension, elevated hematocrit levels, renal disease, even uh, it's not well understood that, um, you know, Drugs like telemisartan, which is one of eight different ARBs that we could use here, is actually a drug candidate for dementia-type related treatment cases. Yeah. So the whole point of the, the story is, I'm not sure if I laid that out very clearly, is clearly there's a problem when we raise estrogen. There's, there's a case of benefits, hypertrophic response, forced production response, cardiovascular protection, you know, renal protection, but what are we going to do about water retention? And my argument is, well, why don't you leave the estrogen alone and just go, go and fix the, the actual core of the problem, which is the system that modulates 
water retention within the human body, which is mm -hmm. which is not estrogen. It's not, it's not a direct effect. And then secondarily, underpinning that, why are we blaming estrogen when we know that testosterone has the same effect? We're okay to let testosterone run, but for some reason we want to single out the the hormone estradiol and, and and say that's causing water retention when it's certainly a stimulatory input, but it's one of multiple inputs. Exactly, exactly. So there's two things you brought up. Um, the athletes that are saying, you know, we don't want to crash our estrogen. You know, we, mm -hmm. we just we just want our lower it a bit. But meanwhile, mm -hmm. you're talking about all the benefits that it's causing. Sure. Uh, in regards to the water retention as being one stimulatory input, yes, uh, among many, yes. Mm -hmm. My experience has been anytime anyone's had water retention, gynecomastia, whatever, I ask them what the protocol is. They're either injecting once a week, twice a week, which you would assume would be fine due to the long half-life of the ester being about seven, eight days, or, you know, depending on who you ask. You yeah. figure, you know, twice a week should be more than sufficient. But I see guys, including myself, have to do daily shots or every other day shots. And by doing daily shots, their levels stay much more stable. All these issues, the water retention, the guy just go away. Then they find themselves able to slowly titrate, raise their weekly dose over time. Yep. But they're raising it by keeping levels stable by doing the daily shots. And they're like, well, now my E2 is double what it was. And my you know, testosterone is almost double what it was. And yep. I don't have any of those issues I had back then. I, I've, I've been finding more and more it was an issue of if those if your androgen levels are fluctuating or estrogen levels or any any of these hormones are just constantly going up and down and your body is constantly in the state of flux you wind up with the water retention and the gyno and the brain fog and you know the libido is there one day and it's gone the next and the erections are there one day won't gone the next yep. just to find a frequency whatever that frequency might be where I, I take this at this given frequency and i always feel the same every day and these issues always seem to kind of vanish i, I agree yeah i think it's yeah. interesting because my general recommendation to people is is that you should inject with the highest frequency that you can tolerate without it being a burden on your life mm -hmm. whatever that means yeah so for someone like myself and, and much of my audience we are exposing ourselves to drugs like recombinant human growth hormone that needs to be administered every day in fact, a lot of the protocols call for it to be injected multiple times during the day. So I'm part of a tribe that says, look, you know, our injection frequency is how many times per day you're taking the drugs, not, not you know, per week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you fall into that category, really, then you just go, well, what just makes sense is that we fall into a model where we're talking about pre-filled subcutaneous syringes where we're microdosing on a daily basis. So typically what I recommend to people, as I said, the highest frequency that you can tolerate without it being a burden. If every day is a burden, then don't do it. Because what I would argue is the difference between a shot every week and two shot, you know, a shot every two weeks is is it's life changing. It's like wow, right? You're in, and 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 the difference between you know a frequency of twice a week versus once is significant. It's a big difference. But obviously, as the frequency gets smaller and smaller and smaller the magnitude of benefit does decline. It's fair, that's fair to say, right? So the yes. difference between every second day and every day is not, wow, it's, mm, you know what I mean? But yeah. What, yeah I, can, I can admit that to myself. If I go to every other day, I feel yep. almost as good. It's like it's 90%. Almost as good. I, yep. I can notice a tiny bit because I'm that in tune. Yep. When I go to daily, it's more. Yep. Um, and the only reason I stuck to it is I said, well, every other day, then it's like, is this shot day? Or was I shoot yesterday? Because I'm old and my brain is like going, right? Sure. Whereas the daily shots, load up seven syringes on a Sunday, throw them in my bathroom drawer, Monday, pick out of it, give yep. myself my shot, done Agreed. next. It's, um, it's, it's really just, as, is it a burden? If it's not, yep. then you should do it. Yeah. If it's a burden, then let's, 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 let's compromise. Let's, fi let's find something that you can manage. But also what I find is, I mean, I, th I think it's fair to say this is just universally true, and that is the degree of intra-individual response to inputs is, is mind-bogglingly profound, yeah? Yeah. There are, there are individuals out there that are highly tolerant, and they can take a shot a week, and they don't seem to have any problems, and there are other individuals that are hypersensitive, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and, and you have to be prepared to say, look, you're in, there are, there, there are, everybody gets de dealt certain cards, right, and you have to play the hand that you got. So if, if you're that guy that requires, you know, hormone replacement therapy strategies, but you're so sensitive to the inputs that you need to go to high frequency injections, I think you just need to say, look, it's, it's not a prescription that everyone must follow,
but it's it's it there is benefit into high frequency administration and if you need to do it you need to do it there's that's the that's the price of administration as it were or the or the or the or the the, the price of, of of you know playing the game let's call it that yeah i always tell people are you a type a personality yes go to the extreme get it done you're not sure. a type a f- figure out you know what what would you be able to get through and get yep. an actual done. if you're not a type a personality you got to inject every day and you're missing two three shots a week i mean you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot no i agree with that so let's talk just talk a little bit about uh i think it's fair to say again i i regularly offend you know large swathes of the audience sort of thing that listen to me like it's it's just a common thing <laughs> and and the reason behind that quite bluntly is the some of the things i say i'm the i'm the lone voice in the wilderness saying these things but i think it's fair to say some of the things i say the majority of the tribe will go yes we can get on board with that and some of the things are like wow that's out there like no nobody talks in that terms i think it's fair to say things like that the highest frequency you can tolerate you know that that's a that's a fair statement. Most people go, yes, we can live with that. You're not telling everyone that they have to do that. You're in, you're, you're you're making a a general recommendation, and and you should take that on board. If we talk then about, so do most people basically need to take an aromatized inhibitor? I would argue that you should basically be trying to take as much testosterone as you can tolerate. And I am addressing my tribe now here to be specific, the enhanced community as much testosterone as one can tolerate as a genetically unique individual without the need for an aromatized inhibitor and without the need for DHT blocking. Now, how much testosterone that is, is dependent upon the genetic response, the inter-individual response of the individual. For some guy, that's going to be 200 milligrams a week. For some guys, that's going to be 400 milligrams a week. There is a tremendous variation. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to introduce drugs that are really have no therapeutic benefits. I think it's fair to say drugs like aromatized inhibitors, drugs like DHT blockers have no therapeutic benefits at all. Like they bring nothing to the table. They're really just there for us to manage estrogen. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you think about it, you just go, well, why don't I just take as much estrogen as I can tolerate as a genetically unique individual? I'll start at this dose and titrate my way forward, feel forward for effect. And when I reach that point, I'll introduce a secondary drug that doesn't bring more estrogen or doesn't bring more DHT with it. A simple example for your tribe would be something like Provirin. So Provirin allows us effectively to manage the androgen-estrogen relationship or ratio, if you will, yeah, so that we don't have gynecomastic outcomes and still maintain high elevant estrogen levels for all the, the many benefits that I talked about. So typically, what we find ourselves in a situation where we're saying, okay, as much testosterone as you can tolerate as a genetically unique individual without an AI, without DHT blocking, when you reach that threshold, we're going to walk a secondary compound in, you know, ideally a DHT derivative. Most people accept Provirin as being okay. We, 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 we're okay with that. Like they, they, the separation point tends to be when we talk about anabolic steroids like Masteron and Provirin and your Prima Bolin, sorry, but most people can live with Provirin as a as a hormone replacement discussion. Yep. And then you'd go, okay, so that that has estrogen at the levels, you know, we want to run them as high as we can tolerate them for all the many benefits, but we can manage the potential impact as a stimulatory input on gynecomastia on breast tissues for managing the androgen relation. And then we, all we have to do is manage the concept of high elevated estrogen and water retention, which is, as I said, we would close that door through the introduction of, a, of an ARB or an angiotensin receptor blocker. And when you understand what angiotensin 2 does, this is the effect of molecule of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, right? And it's really, it's that molecule that is underpins mo- or is the plague of most of the problems of my tribe. Angiotensin 2 is responsible for cardiac remodeling. It's the treatment methodology that's used for left ventricular hypertrophy. They introduce angiotensin receptor blockers. So we're using it in a prophylactic sense. It underpins elevated hematocrit levels. It's not well understood that when you lower angiotensin 2, you no longer have to donate blood. That's kind of taken off the the cards. A lot of, I think it's older guys, it's fair to say, not everybody, but a lot of us are pushing against the the markers of hypertension where you might want to look at that and say, is, is that a little too high? I think that's fair. You know I mean? So, and then you, as I said, you start to go through the other magical benefits. So what we've done is 
by using provirin and by using an angiotensin receptor blocker, we're introducing drugs that have therapeutic benefits, yeah? Where an AI has no therapeutic benefits, provirin and angiotensin receptor blockers do have therapeutic benefits, and we're managing the potential implications of elevated estrogen, not by suppressing the estrogen itself, but by dealing with the potential uh, outcome or, or, or consequences of elevated estrogen, gynecomastia, water retention. Yep. So I think it's fair to say, I said, I, some things I say are controversial. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. I don't think it's unreasonable to say that, like all endocrine hormones, estradiol has an inverted J curve attached to it. And what I mean by that is there's such a thing as too little, there's such a thing as too much. I think that's fair. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think what a lot of guys, I, I don't think anyone will argue like crushing estrogen is a good, good idea. I mean, I know a lot of people say this. I just, I see those people as poorly informed. Yeah. The more aware and awake of us go, no, 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 that's, that's silly. We, we want to, we want to manage estrogen. We don't want to crush estrogen. Yeah. And some and guys so have different uh, uh, ideas as to what crushed estrogen is. Yeah. Some people say, oh, it's, it's only if I get it below five, it's crushed. And I'm like, no, you, you crushed that a long time ago. <laughs> that's, that, 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 that's highly suppressed. So, so what's, what I find is really interesting then is, so then this falls into the conversation of, well, are we actually talking about measuring estradiol levels in serum blood? Yeah. Or are we talking about treating outcomes that we see? Let's call, let's call them symptoms. Yeah. Okay. What I don't think is well understood, I just, I just want to fl flash a couple of slides up here that I, that I regularly show people because it does, it does surprise a lot of people. So I, I think most people in your community would be familiar with the premise that there are, you know, different estradiol uh, pathology, you know, uh, tests that can be undertaken. I, I just show this as a client of mine as an example and, and understand when you see, you know, follicle stimulating luteinizing hormone, like at that level of suppression, this is an expected outcome for someone that's using androgenic and anabolic steroids. But the point being is what we did here was we got the standard estradiol readings and the LCMS readings taken on the same day from the same uh, serum draw. And you can see the difference, the magnitude of difference in those markers. So the, the standard estradiol test is basically saying, you know, 320, let's just call them units because units do vary around the world. It's just simpler mm -hmm. to say units, 323 units. And the uh, LCMS is basically half of that, 148. So most people would be familiar with the fact if you want to have a credible conversation about estradiol and, and measuring estradiol through pathology, you have to choose the, the sensitive test. I think that's fair. Would you agree that mo most people yes. in your tribe are aware of that? I, I, what, I, what I don't think a lot of people are aware, though, is when you look at that, the sensitive test, these, this, these tests on Bruca, this is the sensitive test I'm showing you, right? It's important to understand that the reason that we do the uh, the sensitive test is it still needs to be a relatively inexpensive and high, fast throughput methodology for testing. It's not considered to be the gold standard. It's meant to be inexpensive. So the biggest takeaway would be here is if you actually look at this and we're looking at um, E2 levels in uh, postmenopausal women prior to receiving aromatized inhibitors here, okay? So the point being is we have a sensitive test here in this first column. Uh, these are the client uh, patients, one through eight. So we have a, a sensitive test here and then an RIA test, which is considered to be the gold standard, but it's prohibitively expensive and slow. It can't be used for assays. right? And, and the real takeaway here is when you look down that, you go, well, there's actually a big difference between those. Even though we would call it sensitive, it's still not of the magnitude of accuracy that I think most people would associate. So if you see here, just, just I mean, some of them are close, that's fair, but some of them, like this one here on, on patient number six, it says, you know, 11.5 units, and then the gold standard says seven. That's fairly significant for what you would consider to be a sensitive test. That's a pretty mm -hmm. big variance, right? So in other words, the point is, even if you're in that domain of saying, look, we've, we long ago abandoned the standardized estradiol readings, we're looking at sensitive you know, readings, LCMS readings, you need to understand, but that's not accurate. That's fast throughput and inexpensive testing.
If you want accurate, you have to go to the gold standard. And the point I'm making here then is, so if you're chasing a number, you need to be aware of even that number is not what we would consider to be a high level. And this is something that the, the, this, this graphic that I'm going to show you here is, is not related to estradiol. It's related to IGF-1 levels. But I want to show it as a point. What this is, is a, a serum draw for uh, growth hormone and IGF-1 levels taken from someone that suffered from acromegaly, which is basically where a, a patient overproduces growth hormone you know, as a result of typically they have a, a pituitary tumor or other, of some other type of disease state. And what they effectively did was took a sample and sent it off to 23 different laboratories. And you can see on the graphic on the, on the, 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 the left-hand side, the variation that came back from those tests. And so the, the point I'm making, if we close this back around, is a lot of people that are chasing numbers don't realize these numbers are not accurate. These numbers are designed to be fast, dirty, cheap throughput for assays. And if you want accurate, you actually have to basically go through a different testing methodology, not the typical assay that's available in you know, the, the, the pathology center on the corner. You can do it and it's done in certain you know, uh, research settings. Okay. But the whole point of like, you know, you drop into the thing, they take your blood and they give you a PDF in the afternoon that has these things. It's very important for people to understand if you're chasing numbers, just be aware you might not be chasing a number that is anywhere near as accurate as you think it is. And this is yeah. true across the board, testosterone, estradiol, IGF-1 levels. This, this is true across the board. And the other thing a lot of people still don't grasp is you cannot base your labs on the range when you're on TRT or on anabolic steroids. You can't say, oh, my estradiol is here and the range is from here to here. That range is for men, not on TRT. It's for natural guys. If you're jacking up your testosterone levels, your E2 levels will be higher by default. You can you can no longer use those range. The range is not designed for men on TRT or on anabolic. I, I agree. Not, not only would I say that, again, it's not well understood that we have studies specifically on young, healthy, natural athletes. And the, the range of testosterone that we see from these athletes is it's more like the type of ranges that you associate with puberty. 1,200 nanograms per deciliter, 1,300 nanograms per deciliter is not unusual in healthy young men. Mm -hmm. What you see when you see natural ranges, you have to understand most people that go into those settings are not healthy young men. You know, so, yeah. so, so the published ranges of laboratories, you have to understand, it's like, it's like when we look at the liver function tests or the kidney function tests, you understand those tests were effectively designed for people laying in a hospital bed that are sick. Mm -hmm. it's, very, it's very difficult to take that pathology work and apply it to an athlete because, you know, we see markers of creatinine kinase, of, you know, liver marker, what we would call liver, uh, liver injury markers that are really just a consequence of our behaviours. You know, just natural training raises prolactin levels to, to levels that most people would be shocked by, yeah? So, you know, yeah. if you took a hard training natural athlete and presented his, you know, worst case scenario of like, you know, not drug-induced liver injury, just consequence to hard training, you know, the average general practitioner would have a freaking heart attack like, and, and fall out of his chair because he's used to seeing old sick men, for want of a better word, healthy, yeah. fit, young athletes tend to go to sports doctor, which is sports medicine doctors, or they go to specialist laboratories. You know, um, mm. So, you know, this is a, again, it's just an extremely complicated subject. And when you start pulling on threads like we're pulling on, you just realize, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gaps in this discussion that I don't think a lot of people realize. So I would basically say this. Yes, it's very interesting to look at pathology work. I look at blood work all day long with my clients, but you have to understand that realistically what we should be asking ourselves is if there is an inverted J-curve to estrogen and we know too little is, is deleterious to our health and it's fair to say, well, too much is potentially deleterious to our health, but we want to slide it up the scale as far as we can go so we can leverage the hypertrophic and, and force generation and potential plausible you know, protective benefits, test, but not so far that we start to in, you know, incur some type of threat. If that makes sense. It begs the question, well, how far is that? H how far can we go before we should start to be concerned? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I'm notorious for is uh, upsetting people, but we have a, 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 a fabulous amount of data on, you know, very specific cohorts that answer these questions and it, and it makes people uncomfortable, but that's to me just, you know, like we need to be grown up and have these conversations. We have 
you know, I have guidelines from the endocrine society that talk about if we take a man and transition him to female, okay? So transgender, basically, treatment practices, what is best practices and what is acceptable? And when you look at that, one of the things they do is they take a man that was born as a man and wishes to be identified as a female, and they effectively reverse the hormonal profile to mimic that of a, of, of a woman. So in other words, they, they lower the testosterone levels down and they raise the estrogen levels up. So the endocrine society is more than happy if you wish to become a woman for you to walk around with estrogen levels mimicking that of healthy female pre, pre-menopausal women, which mm-hmm. is what, 100 to 200 units versus the 60. As, you know, men start flipping out at 60, but you go, so the, endocrine, so the endocrine society is more than happy for you to have 200, right? We don't have any, this is, this is within treatment guidelines, in fact, there's even some suggestion that we can push this far as far as 500 in some individuals, as long as they are on a case by case basis. But the standard treatment methodologies for transgender, you know, uh, individuals is we push their test- testosterone levels into the range of 100 to 200 units. Okay, and and you think about that, you're going like, well, so what potential deleterious effects are we seeing if that's treatment methodology? Surely. If there were deleterious outcomes, we would see it in that cohort. If there was mm-hmm. cardiovascular risk, if there was prostate risk, if there was you know, a- anything to be discussed, that would basically contraindicate that treatment methodology. They would say you mm-hmm. can't do that because you will induce prostate cancer into those individuals. Okay? Meanwhile, they're getting the protection from the elevated estradiol. So this is the great irony is like everyone wants to lean into, well, the endocrine society says, and I agree, the endocrine society says, if you're a man, you should, estrogen level should be this, but they're more than happy if you make that life choice to, to identify as a woman. Oh, now you can have 200. So you have to ask, well, what are we trying to basically do here? You know, why, why is the separation point? And I would argue, as long as you understand that as you raise estrogen levels, you must raise androgen levels, or well, it actually happens in reverse, as you know. Estrogen being a metabolite of, of testosterone, mm-hmm. we raise our testosterone levels. As you raise testosterone levels and you get higher and higher and higher, ultimately you get into super physiological range. It's it's a plausibly natural process that estrogen should follow. Why would we attenuate it? Because there's some concern of a, a marker you get to that introduces adverse risk. Okay. But this is the irony, but it's okay for transgender. But that's based, again, on this range, that the range is based on a population of sick people, not on TRT, and then we're right back to the beginning. Correct. And guys, and- by the way, everyone watching was talking about transitioning. Uh, if you take a guy and you want to transition to a woman, you don't just give him estradiol. You chemically castrate. You have to drastically tank his androgen levels Okay, so it's not just a matter of giving estradiol. So make sure you guys are aware. Agreed. So this is one of the, the you know the, the the great challenges our tribe has is we have a great many what I call citizen scientists in our in our community. Yeah, which is something I encourage. Just to be super clear, to everyone, I don't hold a PhD. I am not a scientist. I consider myself to be the voice of experience, the guy that's been doing this for thirty eight years. Yeah, but when you start to look at this and you understand, well, you know, h- historically DHT was viewed as the enemy. Historically, estradiol was viewed at the enemy as the enemy. But if you think about it, th- this is the same behaviors that we see. Well, fat was the enemy, and then carbs are the enemy, and sugar is the enemy, and all this. So it's just a, it's just how it is. And we're going to, in my opinion, ultimately arrive at this place that says, listen, elevated estrogen is a hypertrophic pathway and a forced production pathway that our community are trying to leverage. Okay. And we also know that elevated estrogens are protecting us from the deleterious effects of elevated or super physiological levels of androgens. So we want to run our estrogen levels as high as we can tolerate them without experiencing estrogenic side effects, which really, and I'm happy to hear anyone's and, but I would argue are, well, water retention and gynecomastia. These are the two side effects, you know? More than any, any, I don't know whether you've heard it. Do you, have you heard any other feedback from your audience about and you know and, and another example? Are they the what two else? That, yeah, and what else? Yeah, insulin. Yeah, insulin resistance. I mean, those are the top three. But it's like it's kind of like what you're mentioning before. It's one factor that gets stimulated out of many that causes it. It's not estradiol is never the direct factor that is causing the gyno. Because right. then right. we go back to the same analogy where I was saying. Well, how is it that I've just raised my 
E2 levels by six times compared to what was before, and yep. the gyno I had from where it was going away. So, so I just, I just want to, you know, I apologize. I cut you off, sir. That's okay. I, I just wanted to flash this screen up. This, this is just, uh, you know, that discussion about gynecomastia. So, gynecomastia is the result of a imbalance between stimulatory action on breast tissue and inhibitory action. So, if you imagine a seesaw, yeah. And on one side, we have inhibitory action. That is basically testosterone and androgens. And on the other side, we have estrogen, growth hormone, progestin, prolactin. These are all you know, stimulatory actions. And so we need to have these two, two in balance. Yeah? So, so a great example of the fact that it's not just estrogen is that um, gynecomastia is a well-documented side effect of DHT blocking. So guys that are given, you know, finasteride or dudasteride, you know, there are some individuals when that cohort, and again, I'm not talking about 100%, I'm saying a, a significantly large enough percentage of individuals that it is a known side effect. It's the third highest documented side effect of finasteride use is gynecomastia. Why? Not because you're elevating estrogen levels, or you're basically are fundamentally lowering the, the inhibitory inputs here. Okay. And so you can see here, yes, it is fair to say if you leave your testosterone or you leave the inhibitory actions at the same level and you start raising up the stimulatory actions, you are going to have a problem. This is fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you balance them out, as I said, as you raise testosterone and as you raise estrogen, you were to introduce, say, 25 milligrams of provire in a DHT derivative that is incapable of being converted to estrogen and consequently, just for anyone that's interested, does not cause prostate issues in healthy male prostates. In fact, it's shown to improve, you know, prostate, you know, quality of life score. It's actually beneficial treatment to people with lower urinary tract infections. Just people say, you know, prostate, prostate. But if we, if we say, okay, so testosterone, we raise testosterone levels. Consequential to that, we see the elevation of estradiol you know, and estradiol is a stimulatory action on, on breast tissue, and we start to see the first indications of an imbalance, then plausibly the next action would be one of two things. You introduce a drug like an aromatize inhibitor that has no therapeutic benefits, period, and it just has problems to, to lower the stimulatory action, or you leave the stimulatory action where it is elevated, and you introduce another androgen, which has therapeutic benefits, things that we that we can leverage, right? And 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 deal with it by managing the androgen estrogen ratio. Both of those actions effectively change the ratio between androgen and estrogen. They change the stimulatory and inhibitory action on breast tissue. But one is by lowering one side of the seesaw, and one is by raising up the other side. And I would always argue that. I would rather introduce a drug that has plausible therapeutic benefits associated with it that, that creates an outcome than one that does not. You know, mm -hmm. The idea of taking a drug that has no therapeutic benefits and the only reason I'm taking it is so I can take too much testosterone, more than I can tolerate as a genetically unique individual, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me if I have a choice. Now, I, I guess this is where I opened up the conversation saying, I and our tribe have the great luxury of doing whatever the hell we want, basically. <laughs> yeah. So I understand I'm empathetic. A physician may not have that luxury. A physician may say, look, if I introduce testosterone, I cannot give you provirin, I cannot give you masteron, I cannot give you an androgen that cannot be converted into the metabolite estradiol. I cannot do that. That is not within my power. So I don't have that choice. And that is, I, I am empathetic to that. And this is where... We have, uh, we have a, a luxury in our tribe. We can do whatever the hell we want, basically. So, mm -hmm. But I would argue if you had those two choices, only, a, 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 you know, I don't, I don't want to be too strong with language. I was going to say only a, fool, only a fool would take the choice that says, look, here's a drug that has no therapeutic benefits, a list of potential problems with it. We're going to suppress estrogen rather than raising up the androgens. Why, why would you not raise up the androgens and get the yeah. therapeutic benefits from it? It doesn't make any sense. And this is the same thing is true of something like, uh, even prolactin management, you can see prolactin up here as a, a stimulatory input on, on, on breast tissue. Okay? So, so one of the things we could do is if we had elevated prolactin levels, we could plausibly introduce a drug like cabagolin. But you know, why would you do that? There's no therapeutic benefits to the drug cabagolin, a long list of potential deleterious consequences. Why would we simply not introduce a drug on the other side of the, uh, of the inhibitory action to balance those two things out? You know? Yeah. So and even high dose B6 is known to be pretty good at that. 
Sure. I mean, there's, 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 I think it's fair to say, you know, whenever you have a, a solution, there's always going to be multiple pathways that can, you know, take you from point A to point B. My whole story is about recognizing that there are probably multiple pathways and one of those pathways is going to make more sense than the others. Yeah. Do you yeah. Know? So it's about looking at those pathways and, and, and choosing which one is right for you as an individual rather than having a blanket model that says, look, you know, we need to suppress estrogen because estrogen is the enemy, as it were. Well, sometimes it's, I've seen an issue of it where the androgen levels weren't necessarily high enough but the doctor doesn't want to raise it further sure. because of the range, you know, yep. but he's like, okay, then you're going to be at 12, 1300. That's not natural. Well, it's not natural now. It's hard to find a guy at 12, 1300. Now it used to be, they used to be running around all over the place. Yeah. That's one thing. So, and so then we fall into the other category of, you know, like I've done a lot of videos with um, Dr. Jordan Grant, how he discusses how estradiol is an intricate hormone so that if since estradiol is made directly in the tissue, we're only seeing a little bit of the, uh, a little bit that is basically leaking back into the serum. So he says, well, how reliable now is this test going to be? Whether you're doing a regular estradiol test or, or sensitive, you're just getting that tiny little bit leaking out into the serum. So the big analogy I was, was using is if I have a swimming pool that's got a leak and I put a bucket by the leak and I and I collect water overnight, the next morning I go and I go, oh, I got two liters of water in my, that leaked in my bucket. So how much is in the swimming pool? It's mm. how, how are you supposed to know, right? You're not, you're not, it's not like you're measuring testosterone, which is, is actively circulating in the serum and you can get a pretty accurate rep representation of how much testosterone is in your serum. It's not really the case with estradiol. So even then a lot of guys are making judgment mistakes based on a lab that doesn't really tell us much to begin with. I, th I think, you know, to, 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 to come full circle on that, that, that's what I'm suggesting is, that's true of a lot of pathology work for, for our community, yeah? As I said, you just need to look at, you know, well, our kidney health markers are not direct. That's an indirect marker. Our, our you know, markers for, you know, drug-induced liver injury, well, AOT and AST are direct markers. You know, like, you know, it's, and what I mean by that is anyone that is, you know, a hard-training athlete is going to see elevations of AOT and, and AST as a, just as a consequence of their behaviours in the gym. Mm -hmm. and, and so the point being is whether it's creatinine kinase, whether it's ALT, whether it's creatine, creatinine, whether it's estradiol, you know, and, and, and you start going down the line and going, a lot of these things are not really good measurements of what's going on in, in individuals that, that train. I do agree that there's probably a traditional segment of the population. If we go back and look at historically who was administered testosterone replacement therapy 30 years ago, yeah, that was probably truer. During, they were legitimately older men, you know, experiencing extreme hypergonadal outcome. You know, doctors were very, you know, remittent. They, they really didn't want to put you on testosterone in place with therapy. It's becoming more and more popular. And we're starting to see more and more healthy, when I say young, you know, guys in their 40s and guys in their 50s, that for all intents and purposes, for all other measures would be considered to be healthy individuals. They just experiencing hypergonadal outcome. And so these, these pathology markers aren't really the best markers that we should be leaning into, whether it's kidney health, whether it's liver health, whether it's, you have to be very, I'm not saying we don't do them. I, I, I as I said, read blood work all day. You just have to interpret them with a degree of caution. You don't simply look at that marker and go, this guy's estradiol level says X. And so that that's too much. I, I, mm -hmm. I think that's overly simplistic and we need to, we need to move forward from that point and start to look at you know, the individual and, and what else is happening in, in, you know, where are his androgen levels? Can we manage this through, you know, as his androgen estrogen ratios? Is he taking in ARB? Is he managing water retention? Is he experiencing estrogenic side effects? Because my, my strategy, if I go back and said, take as much testosterone as you can tolerate as a genetically unique individual without experiencing estrogenic or DHT related side effects. We don't want to experience those things, but that that marker, that number, should be tailored to the individual, right? Not 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 a blanket model that says you know estrogen ratio should be here, set here. Individuals yeah. should have estradiol levels of th this marker. Well, my estradiol levels, I will drive my estradiol levels as high as I can tolerate them. And I, I just want to show you one last slide, if I can. I appreciate your your uh, latitude and and, and, and patience. Let, let me just show you this. This is, in my opinion, and and this really is specifically directed towards the enhanced community, yeah, not necessarily the, 
you know, the, the TRT community. I would argue in the 1970s, steroid users were worried about liver health, acne, gynecomastia, hair loss, these types of discussions was where, where, you know, where, where we all went into. Today, the conversation is really about kidney health, heart health, and brain health. Okay. And this is a study that basically showing is like estrogens are attenuating the, uh, the neurodegradative effects, basically, in the human brain. But the amount of estrogen that you need to realize this is approaching the levels that we see in pregnant women. This is not low levels of estrogen are cognitive protective. This is high levels of estrogen plausibly can offset the, the deleterious effect of you know, toxic assault. And what I mean by toxic assault is androgens are cognitive, uh, are, are detrimental to cognitive health. Estrogens are considered to be neuroprotective, yeah? But you need to drive them high. And, and studies like this show us just how high we need to drive them. We need to drive them to estrogen levels as high as you can tolerate as an individual, not at what we would consider to be your know, normative type ranges. Yeah. Gotcha. So it's a, it's a, it's a, I appreciate it's a conversation you can really, you know, need to balance between, well, that's not really us. We're not the enhanced community. I respect that. And then also, a great deal of what I'm talking about may be outside the scope of, of, of administration through a physician. I can administer Provirin at will. I can, you know, walk into my local pharmacy and, and order the ARB telemassadin over the counter. During, not everybody is in that position. Not everybody wants to be in that position. I think it's just important that these types of conversations go on so that people are aware of the larger landscape rather than being, you know, you know, railroading to discussion that says, look, everything recommended by the endocrine society is in our best interest. You know, that, that's the recommendation they hold. And I think it's fair, but I, I think these conversations should be had within, within our community. Yeah. yeah. Um, one question, um, actually, guys are just very fast. I was using Stephen Devils' account for this Zoom, and I said Stephen Devils under my my ugly mug over here uh, for the last <laughs> the beginning. I just I just changed it now to Danny Bossa. So, yeah, Stephen's Stephen's biceps are a lot bigger than mine. Okay, so I'm not Stephen Devils. I'm Danny Bossa. Um, do you um, have you seen evidence of estradiol levels plateauing? So the, the concept is we only have a given amount of aromatase enzyme, meaning I guess the analogy would be if I have a winery and the winery can make a given number of bottles of wine a day, right? But let's say I take all the grapes in the world and I bring it to this winery, well, the winery is only still going to be able to make that same amount of bottles a day. It's not going to be able to make more just because you're bringing more to it. So there's a, there's a discussion I had recently was because there's only a limited amount of aromatase, it, it can only produce a given amount of estradiol, no matter how much testosterone you, you send, you give it, yep. you could be taking, you know, a hundred grams of testosterone a week. And it doesn't mean that your estradiol levels are going to continue to climb. They will eventually plateau. Are you hundred percent agree? So there's actually, you know, again, I, I like to share my opinion with, with individuals, but I also like to uh, back up everything that I say with, with, with clinical data. Yeah, this is a, um, a study that basically looks at greater doses of testosterone, 51, 25, 300, 600 milligrams a week of testosterone. Most people are familiar with the baseline study that was done. Was, this is a spin-off of that that actually looks at estradiol and DHT conversion from those dosages. And so you can kind of see here, um, uh, just, just if it's difficult for people to make out, the top right-hand uh, image where it basically, so left-hand image where it says A, is showing a total E2 levels, yep, and then total DHT. So we have total uh, E2 and then free E2. And then just as importantly, marker C is showing the basically uh, total E2 to testosterone ratio, the ratio between estradiol and testosterone. And you can see here exactly what you've described. So estradiol production is rate limited by the available pool of aromatase substrate that's genetically unique to every individual, yeah? And in a general sense, so as you raise testosterone levels, we see estradiol levels do elevate, but they don't elevate in a linear fashion. And of course, testosterone and estradiol ratios decline as we elevate testosterone. Now, the big question here is, well, this is showing 600 milligrams a week of testosterone, which is far outside the scope of really your audience discussion. So the answer is yes, but 
I would argue, well, yeah, but not within TRT type levels. You know, yeah. it's completely plausible that there might be an individual out there that is you know, that just happens to have you know a, a a unique genetic profile that says you know that that's the guy, right? But I would say. These are healthy, younger and older men. The white bars are older men over 60 years old. The, the uh, black bars are young men. Um, otherwise healthy, so these are not, you know, this is not a uh, hypergonadal group. This is people that basically were given a suppressant drug to suppress testosterone production and their testosterone was introduced to see the consequence of that. And so you can see as we raise testosterone, Ultimately, there is a rate limiting factor of estrogen production, but it is it is at a at a threshold that I think is outside of the scope of the conversations of your audience. Yeah, I got invited on a podcast uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago. Uh, two guys that are fairly well known, and I brought up this issue, and they both kind of looked at me like. And then I got messages through my Facebook after telling me how completely full of shit I was, and I'm like, all right. Yeah. No yeah, I, I, I guess this is part, <laughs> part, part of the. So I just want to let me just let me if you could give me the latitude because I I fully expect because I always get this I get individuals saying yeah that's bullshit that's bullshit Julian. I understand that I just want to show you one last slide. So this is a graphical representation of the recommendations from the Endocrine Society Clinical Practices Guideline for for transgender men. So in other words, you're born as a man transitioning to a female identity, right? And you can see these are the guidelines. So they're basically going to put your estradiol levels at 200 to 250 picomoles per liter. Right? That's completely okay. During nope, we're not we're not concerned about prostate cancer. We're not concerned about cardiovascular health. This is standardized. And you can see here the second notation is here. There is a recommendation in the 2019 guidelines from uh, like it's a little bit more obscure. It's, it's published in New Zealand, admittedly, but it basically says, okay, maybe up to 500, but that's on a client by client basis. So in other words, the, the, the premise here is who, who set the goal? Who, who said 60 is the limit? And this like, is picograms. Yeah. This isn't even nanograms for death sleep. This is <laughs> picograms. Shit. Okay. Yeah. So, so again, like when, when guys go, well, you know, it's, it's deleterious to your health to push over say 60, I'm going to say, who the fuck said that? Because the endocrine society are more than happy for men to do that as long as you understand that, well, but that's transitioning into female identity. The, 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 the outcome here is not one of deleterious to your health because if it would, it wouldn't be the recommendation. If this induced prostate cancer, if this induced cardiovascular health, if this induced cognitive health issues, it wouldn't be the recommendation. You're in. Hopefully yeah, but I mean, you look at the NHS and you look at a bunch of other places that they put guys on AI by default. Correct. And we, Correct. And we know it's not good, but it's the recommendation. So sometimes Agreed. Agreed. the recommendation is... Now, just to be clear, I don't, I don't drive my estradiol levels to that rate, but if we go back to the, to the previous slide that we were talking about and you're saying, let, let's just hypothetically say, um, you know, an individual was using... 300 milligrams a week of testosterone, which is outside the, the boundaries of testosterone replacement therapy and into what we would call performance enhancing use. Okay. Depends. Depen yeah, depends. I agree. No, depends I depends on the response because I I'm completely on, agree. I'm on that. 300 and I'm just slightly above the I, physiological I, range, but other guys I, on 300, they'd be at triple my levels. So I, I completely agree. That I, I think it's fair to say that, uh, you know, in, you need to judge the individual on a case-by-case -case basis. The degree of intra-individual response is so profound. You literally need to administer the amount of drugs that you want to administer and go and look and see what you see. You have yeah, to. I, yeah. I, always prefer, I always prefer to make that judgment based on maybe what their serum levels are yeah, versus correct. what dose they are taking. Because I've seen guys on 90 milligrams a week and yep. they're super physiological. Like, I, 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 I completely agree. So the, the point I was making here is these would be average responses. You know, understanding that this was a cohort of individuals, we put them into a room and we gave them greater dosages, and this is the typical response that we see. But obviously, this is a spectrum. This is the uh, the mean response. Let's call it that. Yeah. So the point the point of the the statement being here and that is that um, you know, in, as as we raise testosterone levels, estradiol levels go up. But you can see here, even at three hundred milligrams a week, let's let's assume we're talking about the black bars here. You know. This is still, you know, plausibly within, you know, very close to natural limits. But for the older men, you can see there's a disparity between the estradiol levels. So not only is it, you know, you know, case by case genetically, but it's also fair to say that 
it would appear to be that as men age, they are more likely to be higher uh, metabolizers of estrogen from the same fixed dose of testosterone. So again, mm -hmm. you know that you have to have an allowance there. You're saying, look, you know, who are we talking about? Are we talking about a a forty year old, uh, you know? highly athletic individual who plays golf on the weekends and eats very healthy and like, you know, like blah, blah, blah. Or are we talking about someone who's 85 years old, you know, in a nursing home on, you know, a testosterone replacement? You, you can't make blanket rules in this game, in my opinion. You have to, as you correctly said, take an individual, start at a, 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 a determined dose and then feel your way forward and titrate for effect. And I don't like to look at numbers. I like to treat symptoms. I like to look at outcomes because I feel confident that says, look, there are really, there is really no credible evidence that says as we exceed this threshold of test, this threshold of estradiol rather, this is the consequence. And I'm, I apologize, I said 16 times, yeah. but if that was true, then how, why is it not prohibited in transgender you know, treatment models? It, it simply would be. If it induced prostate cancer, we would see that in those individuals. If it induced cardiovascular health risk or cognitive health risk, we would see it in those individuals, and we don't. Yeah. Um, other uh, guys watching this, always get your AST and ALT checked because I am seeing so many guys with just poor liver function. When you have poor liver function, you will be a poor metabolizer of estrogens. And then you wind up with, oh, I've got this, I got this, I got this. I need to take an AI. I need to lower my dose. I, no, your liver is shit. Fix the liver, and then these things are going to get better. I, I, I see this often. This is this is just something I kind of learned recently. Again, I'm not a doctor. I'm I just learn it. I'm learning as I go. Um, but I'm seeing so many guys just with, with fatty liver. Uh, they'll take a high dose inositalcholine for like a month, and then they just feel like a million bucks after that. I've been doing a trial of that. Twice a, twice a year since I've learned about that. And yeah, it, it works great. So. Can I just, I, I just want to touch on one, one last subject. I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions you've got, but just one last subject I want to put there. I, I hear a lot of guys talking about the drug Masteron as being an, an anti-estrogen or, or a means of modulating estrogen. I think it's, it needs, this needs to be cleared up. Yeah. So let sure. me just explain. So historically, Postmenopausal women were administered testosterone as a as a estrogen mediated breast cancer treatment. Right, the challenge with the administration of estrogen, sorry, testosterone to those individuals, it resulted in a high level of virilization. Okay, and really, the development of all anabolic and androgenic steroids was really trying to do this to create a compound derived from testosterone that allowed us the therapeutic benefits of testosterone but at lower androgenic impact so it could be administered to the to what we call the, the androgen sensitive. Mm -hmm. okay? So all of the drugs that you look at, and this is not well understood, really are various companies' inputs to solving the same problem. So here's the problem. We want to give people testosterone, but when we give it to the androgen sensitive as a result in virilization, what, what can the, what can the ph pharmaceutical industry come up with? And we saw a spilling out of, you know, Initially, thousands of drug candidates was resulted in dozens of products brought to market. But what's really important to understand is they were all fundamentally brought to market to solve the same problem. They're all different companies' ideas of how we fix that problem. And what's important to understand about Masteron is its, it's name is Dristanolone Propronate. It was called Masteron as a marketing initiative, MAST, the Latin word for breast, but what people don't realize is it was never developed for breast cancer. What they did was they evaluated testosterone, nandrolone, prima bolin, mastron. They evaluated a number of drug candidates, right? And what they found is they all did the job. They all worked, if you like, right? But mastron was found to be best tolerated of all those drugs by that cohort. It produced the lowest level of virilization, okay? And as a consequence of that, it worked, right? Not quite as interestingly, not quite as well as Nandrolo. Nandrolo, Nandrolo worked by just a small amount. We can just call it the same, but, you know, Nandrolo outperformed Mastron by a small margin. But Nandrolo produced greater virilization in women than Mastron did, significantly so. So they settled on just standalone propionate, and then they marketed it under the Masteron, Masteron brand name, Latin for breast. But again, a lot of people think, you know, for some reason it was developed for that purpose. It was never developed. It was evaluated and considered to be the right drug, you know, for, for the task. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and as a consequence, you have to understand is, so 
it doesn't work because it's an aromatized inhibitor or an antiestrogen. Testosterone was the drug being used. It produced too great a visualization. So unless you see testosterone as an antiestrogen, then how was Masteron? Masteron right. displaced testosterone. And the only reason it placed testosterone, because not because testosterone didn't work, it just produced too high level of virilization. A lot of people mistakenly think that Masteron, one, was developed for breast cancer treatment. It was not. It was brought to market for that. And two is they believe it somehow is an anti-estrogen. Now, there is a conversation to be had, and I accept this, and that is you kind of touched on this before. If we have a rate-limiting estradiol production capacity, which is the amount of aromatized enzyme that's available, okay, and we introduce a whole bunch of drugs to the table, right, which are capable of fundamentally, you know, docking with aromatized the aromatized, uh, aromatized enzyme. You could plausibly see any drug that converts to estradiol at a ratio lower than testosterone. Any drug, nandrolone, dianabol, masteron, primabolin, all the way down the line any one of those as an aromatized inhibitor. So I have no problem if people say, look, under certain conditions, right, where we saturate that pool of aromatized enzyme, right, through the application of these androgens, at certain conditions, at certain values, at certain ratios, then we see a consequential uh, aromatized inhibitor-like effect from the application of androgens. This is completely plausible, okay? But one, you will not realize that unless you saturate that pool of aromatized substrate, right? You have to saturate that pool, which means we're talking about quite high dosages, yeah? Mm -hmm. And two is, but that's true of dianabol. That's true of nandrolone. That's true of all, any drug that basically can dock with the aromatized enzyme. Any drug, drug that can dock with the aromatized enzyme and effectively inhibit or block testosterone docking, right, could be viewed through that filter. But again, because... Masteron was associated with breast cancer, people then just for some reason are naturally drawn to this concept of, well, it's an aromatized inhibitor. It lowers estrogen. This is just not the history of that drug. And then said, so anyone that start, looks at the, the, the studies, you go, well, it was lined up against nandrolone. It was lined up against testosterone unless you're, unless you view, I mean, I said, I'm happy to, if someone says testosterone is an aromatized inhibitor, great, so is Masteron. I mean, but we don't talk in those terms. That's that's not the language that, that our tribe use. So yeah. a, a lot, a lot, there's, there's so so much mythology, there's so much belief. And as I said, you know, the, what frustrates me is, you know, the the evidence I've kind of been showing some slides, like a little bit of study here, a little bit of study there. I don't need to drill too, too much down to it, is all of this information is available in the clinical literature for anyone that wishes to look. If you pull out the the, the studies on estrogen-mediated breast cancer, it's, you know, it, it's, not, it's not like it's a secret. Mm -hmm. It just requires someone that's motivated enough to, to bother to, to, to look, yeah? So the, 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 the caveat to that would be for anyone that is interested in the consideration of adding anabolic and androgenic steroids to testosterone, yeah? One of the biggest misconceptions of our community is that there is a significant differential in the anabolic potential between various testosterone derivatives, Okay, you'll often hear that you know Trembolone is five times more anabolic than this drug, and, and you know Masteron is a weak anabolic steroid. The reality is, is that all anabolic steroids accrete protein tissue at approximately the same rate. Right? This is very clear in evidence. This is not this is not even a discussion. We have very good evidence of greater doses of these drugs lined up side by side in the same study, and they all accrete protein. It's what else they do that determines what drug, when, and how much. So, for example, if we just wanted to adjust the androgen-estrogen ratio, we were not looking to basically do anything in terms of forced production. We might choose a drug like Proviron. But if we wanted to, you know, do, do something else, you know, there's some other action, we could basically consider any number of anabolic steroids provided it did not convert to estrogen. So, so the summary of that would be basically saying this. Dianabol, Winstrol, Anadrol, Masteron, you know, Primabol, and you go down the list, all anabolic steroids accrete protein tissue at approximately the same rate. It's what else they do, the other things they do. And typically they are via what we call non-plastic genomic pathways, forced production, you know, you know, whether it converts to estradiol, whether it converts, whether it does not, all these sorts of things are why you would consider a particular drug as complementary or synergistic to testosterone. Yep. Okay. Uh, just so we're clear, D 
D-ball does aromatize quite a bit more than testosterone, correct? Uh, it's interesting because it's, it converts into, into methyl estrogen. So it's not the right. ratio, but it's the implications of the methylated estrogen that, that you know, me methyl estrogen is what we would call a more potent estrogen. So it actually produces less estrogen, if that makes sense, but a more potent variant of estrogen. So you tend to see a, a, a greater deleterious effect. During, and this is one of the reasons that I'm, my, my, my strategy to most people is really what you should be doing is saying, look, there are certain drugs like d that in my place have no place in responsible drug use. Why? Because, well, it's really designed to replace testosterone. That, that was the intention of that drug, yeah? So it converts to, you know, like it, it's really intended as a, a plausible substitute of testosterone. It was never envisaged that you took testosterone and d together. You know I mean? You took d and, you know, you saw suppression of the HPTA, but d was capable of producing estradiol and capable of basically, you know, for, for into the person meeting the needs of the, 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 the male physiology. Yeah. The challenge, of course, is, well, OK, that's fair enough, but you have to understand, well, it's liver toxic during and plausibly has a significant impact on things like lipid profiling. So when you hold the two side by side and you said, look, I'm going to choose one, I'm going to choose either testosterone or I'm going to choose d -bol, right? d -bol really doesn't make any sense on any level. You know, and I would argue that you will always lean into testosterone and so therefore you take d -bol and you put it aside, right? So, so you would take as much testosterone as you can tolerate without an aromatized inhibitor, right? When you get to that threshold, it just doesn't make sense to bring a drug like d to the table because it brings more estradiol with it, mm -hmm. yeah? Even if it's a methylated version, it's still more estrogen. So you would put that aside and say, I'm not, I'm not sure where you would ever use that. What I want is a drug that doesn't convert to estrogen, Masteron, Primabolin, Anavar, Winstrol, Anadrol. And even amongst those, you'll find that, well, you know, Anadrol is pretty hard on the liver. You know, there's a whole bunch of you know, deleterious consequences of, an of anadrol that you might set aside in, in favour of something that's a little bit more benign, like provirin or, or uh, sorry, not provirin, or prima bowl or masteron, yeah? So in my opinion, you know, I don't know whether you've ever seen like what we call the anabolic family tree where you have like DHT derivatives and 19 nores and the testosterone direct derivatives. And under the testosterone direct derivatives, you see testosterone, boldenone, d you know, t -bol. It's very, very hard to explain under what circumstances that you would choose another androstain in addition to testosterone because they come with estradiol. Mm -hmm. You mean know, like you're kind of going, but I want to take as much testosterone as I can tolerate, and then when I reach that tolerance threshold, I'm going to bring a secondary drug in that does not convert. And so the methodology for most people most of the time is testosterone and a DHT derivative, or you know. Plausibly, you could bring in a 90 nor, but I, I, I tend to steer people towards DHT derivatives because they, you know, at the end of the day, all, all anabolic steroids accrete protein tissue at the same rate. It's what else they do. And synthetic progestins like Trembolone, things like that, tend to have a larger impact on cognitive function than, you know, some, some of the more benign offerings from the DHT derivative family. Yeah. Two questions for you. Have you seen evidence of? high dose testosterone only so specifically testosterone only causing harm of any sort i i, I think it's fair to say that okay, let me let me explain you know what i said about the inverted j curve yeah mm -hmm. i would say low levels of testosterone would need to be considered deleterious to one's health i don't support Absolutely. yeah i think that's fair yeah. most people agree that i think it's also fair there's a there's a sweet spot in which you know we can go up to that point fairly confident that there are no deleterious consequences. You know, I would argue that if we want to play it safe, that we should probably set that marker at the types of levels we see in healthy young at athletes and at, and, and at puberty, 1,200, 1,300 nanograms per deciliter. I, I know I don't have the clinical literature to support me, but I think it's a fair observation to say, look, if we see those levels in natural individuals, right, it's a it's a reasonable discussion to have to say okay there may be some risk there but it's 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 moderate risk yeah I think it's fair to say as you raise androgens higher and higher and higher you should expect to see deleterious outcome you should expect it now what are those things well 
we would expect to see an elevation of, of, as I said, blood pressure. We would expect to see, you know, pr pressure on the kidneys. We would expect to see, you know, again, testosterone is considered cognitive protective up to a certain threshold. Once you exceed that threshold, it's considered to be, you know, detrimental to cognitive health. Yeah. The problem that we have is no one can really answer definitively where that number is. The best that we can get to, in my opinion, is what I stand by, is I would argue that who said you have to be 600 nanograms per deciliter? Why can you not walk around at the levels that I see in my natural bodybuilders? If that guy's 1,200, why can I not be 1,200? I'm, I'm all ears. You know, give me a list of reasons why I can't, and nobody has been able to give me a credible list of reasons. It's fair to say, as you keep going, it's, it's a reasonable expectation. Now, the good news is today, that we have through imaging technology, the capacity to look at arterial health and, and, and plug the, the deposition. We have the capacity to look at cardiac remodeling. We have the ability to look at kidney health and liver health. The one last bastion, as it were, the last frontier is cognitive health, brain health. Yeah. And I would argue that, you know, it's really, again, it's not just about androgen levels about, so it's about saying, okay, so you know, if we raise androgen levels, we need to be mindful of things like insulin resistance, you know, and, and antioxidant strategies and things like that. So it's really a case of saying, if you're going to raise androgen levels into super physiological range, you almost need to step in to say, look, I understand what I'm signing. I'm signing agreement of an expectation of deleterious outcomes. I'm going to get hit by the stick. I just need to, you know, figure out how badly that makes sense. And I always suggest to people is if you go into super physiological angel levels, you need to almost go into that saying, it's not a question of if you get hit by the stick, it's how badly you get hit. Yeah. And I would argue that we are much better informed that we were in the 1970s and 1980s about, you know, cardiovascular health. And as I said, renal health, and we have the technology. I mean, just recently, I, you know, you know, had a client that had some, what I would say, you know, concerning, you know, kidney health functions. So we sent him off and, you know, and, and had his, you know, ultrasound done on his kidneys, just, just to have a look, let's just have a look to see what's going on there. And we, we came away with you know, all of the basically feedback saying, look, you know, we have some elevated creatinine levels, but that's probably a consequence of the fact that simply you are an individual with significantly elevated muscle mass and you train hard. And, you know, this is an enzyme that leaks from the skeletal muscle tissue, you know, to such a degree that your kidneys are just not able to get rid of it rather than an indicator of, you know, you know deteriorating kidney function. Right? Right. So right. it's all of these, you know, it's a balancing act. I think it's, disingenuous i think it's naive to say there's such a thing as safe and that's why i never use that all of my materials as i said are really about recognizing what the possible risks are and then doing our best to come up with a strategy to mitigate to the best of our abilities those those threats to us yeah now having said that within the realms of trt i feel very confidently that you can create a model that allows you to have a you know, a, a very prosperous and very full life without necessarily stepping too far outside the range of what we would call plausibly natural. But those markers, in my opinion, are higher than what the endocrine society will support. I, mean, mm -hmm. okay. I don't have I don't have any problem with guys walking around with, you know, in <clears throat> IGF one levels and testosterone levels and you know ve ve and estrogen levels. Understanding again, estrogen is a hypertrophic pathway. So right outside of recommended ranges by a small margin. Okay. Um, and the last question is just because you were touching on the neurological health guys that get anxiety, mm -hmm. either guys that get anxiety, maybe with small doses of tests or maybe guys that get anxiety when they push their levels a bit too far or guys that get anxiety, if they experiment with different compounds, uh, what have you seen in regards to that? Uh, there's so many posts about anxiety on it. Yeah. I, I think number. it's fair to say that neurotransmitted dysregulation, if we can call it that, that's probably not the right term, but let's just call it that, is a, again, a known consequence of the application of synthetic androgens. Yeah. And I would argue that it's a conversation about dose and compound selection. Yeah. For the most part, we can say, as I said, testosterone is considered neuroprotective up to a threshold, moderate dose of testosterone, good for your brain. You keep going, you should expect to see deleterious effect. But all synthetic androgens, in my opinion, straight out the box, should be considered neurotoxic. All of them, yeah? And I would argue this is, again, like this is where you have to go, okay, so if you're going to put down a, a model, the 90 nor family, the synthetic progestins, would be considered, I think it's fair based on the literature we have to say, 
the, the least desirable for cognitive health. Yeah. So typically we'd say we would lean into testosterone as a base as much as you can tolerate up to a certain point. And then it would appear that DHT derivatives are better tolerated than 19 nor, you know, principally because of the relationship. Most people would be familiar with this, and that is, you know, nandrolone and the nandrolone de derivatives have a relationship, you know, in, as, as progestins as well as an androgen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it's that consequence that seems to cause a lot of the the, the problems like, you know, the trembolone is notorious for it. A lot of people relate problems with, you know, with trembolone. Yeah. And in my opinion, it's a conversation both about compound selection and then dose, because if you consider I have a general rule of thumb that says, look, two times the clinical dose of, of an androgen is probably what we would say, you know, disingenuous to say safe, but reasonably well tolerated by a healthy young man. To give you an example, if we were to say Anavar is given clinically at 20 milligrams a day to individuals for, for these indications, then in our community, we could probably use 40 milligrams with a degree of confidence about we know, we, we know what to expect because we have clinical data at 40, 80, 150 milligrams a day. You know, we, we can predict what we would expect to see. One of the misunderstandings about Trembolone is when Trembolone was in human clinical use, it was given to women for the indications of things like osteoporosis at 50 milligrams a week, right? So people walking around thinking 300 milligrams a week of Trembolone is a small dose. That's a huge dose of Trembolone. So that's like saying, yeah, 100, 150 milligrams of Anavar is nothing. It's like, what are you talking about? That's a lot. You're in. So if Anavar was given at 20 milligrams a day and someone was proposing to take 40 milligrams of a day, it's disingenuous to say safe, but it's a supportable discussion, understanding there's a risk attached to it. Yeah. If someone was taking 100 milligrams a week of Trembolone, I rarely see individuals reporting problems with those types of classes of drugs at, at that dose. It's as they escalate the dose, so you have a mm -hmm. problematic compound at very high dose levels, and then the problems tend to present themselves. At 50 milligrams a week, the clinical dose of Trembolone, most people tolerate that drug very well on a, on, a, on a cognitive impact function. As you raise the dose, you start to see problems with you know, sleep hygiene and, 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 as you said, anxiety and behaviours. And so, so really, to answer your question, it's, it's a conversation about both compound selection, understanding that different classes of compounds are considered to be more or less neurotoxic, yeah, and it's a conversation about then the dose follows. The dose is the poison, as they say. Yeah, yeah. I did a little experiment with Trend a while back. Uh, I forgot I was going to take like a small weekly dose, and I I took one shot, and a couple of days in, my brain was just it was done. Like it was mm -hmm. done. I was like, oh, this stuff doesn't agree with me, so I put it away. And about a month or two later, I said, okay, let me try I'll try a little daily shots, just mm -hmm. like five milligrams a day well, let me just start with that and i'm sure that'll be fine i can touch it up after three days i was insomnia panic anxiety lying in bed claustrophobic it's like yep. this is how do people and, and everyone's going to react different to this stuff correct but it's interesting like when you when you say that observation so if we if we go back to that rule i said well all anabolic steroids accrete protein at approximately the same rate including trembolone yeah so then if your only goal is let's say, well, I'd like to increase cross-sectional area. I want to put on 10 pounds of tissue. You don't need Trembolone to do that. You're in. So it's really a case of then it's what else they do that determines what drug when. Now, where Trembolone really shines and it stands out from other drugs is its relationship as an, an agent of, of anti-catabolic action. And this is very, very often why you see it being you know, led into bodybuilders in pre-contest condition. So for the average person that's just looking at a protein accretion, it's not, it's not a necessary evil. For someone that's trying to get to you know, sub 5% body fat on the stage, it can be a very valuable tool, even at very small dosages. So again, you have to look at the individual and how they tolerate the drug and what are they trying to achieve. And I said, if, if, if people simply view it through the filter saying, look, all I'm really trying to do is you know, I, I would like to raise my androgen levels a little higher than they are, but I don't want to introduce an aromatized inhibitor. Perhaps I can put my testosterone at, say, 200 and put, you know, 100 milligrams of Masteron or 100 milligrams of Primabolin or 100 milligrams of Anavar. Now I have a total of 300 milligrams a week without having the estrogen management situation. Mm -hmm. Really, for, for most people in your community, some testosterone and a DHT derivative is going to fulfill their needs 
it's the most benign solution to meet their needs, understanding that they're really just, you know, they don't, they don't need to expose themselves to what I consider to be higher profile drugs because they don't have that need. Right. Cool. Uh, guys, anyone who is, uh, happy with all the stuff that uh, Victor said here. and very I'm sure, I'm sure, in. I get a lot of pushback. I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. You can't, you can't make everyone happy. I agree. Um, you can check out his, he's got two websites, prepcoachacademy.com. Uh, his main site is victorblackmasterclass.com. Uh, is, he's big on Instagram at victorblackmasterclass. Um, Victor, thank you very much for your time. It's very I, uh, I, 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 I appreciate the opportunity, Danny. It was, a, it was quite a long call. It's probably a little bit longer than some of your other calls. I, I kind of, uh, a, a, lo- yeah. a lot of information. Again, let, let, let's put it out there. And I I always see various opinions, people going, well, that's very refreshing and that's you know insightful and I can go away and pull on some of those threads and you know discover myself more about you know where, where you're leading us and other people that are just going to like poop with things. But, so if, if there's interest from the community and you know people have various questions i'm i'm more than happy to come back on the show at any time and we could pick up the conversation and and, and take it wherever where, wherever your audience would like to take it cool maybe we can do like a q a or something yeah uh, that would be great that would be great awesome right. okay thank you for your time buddy welcome okay